Lebron. Quiz and I really, really had an opportunity to, um, to get to know you and Liz a little better. I was, for many, many years, I was so impressed with the information that you shared. This time, I realized how little I know. I would like for you to tell me, where did your clay career start? Uh, started uh, going to art college in uh, 1959. So uh, this is the 60th anniversary of my first collision with clay. When you started out with clay, did you have, early on, did you have an interest at all in glazes? Well, in those days, uh, you just found the glaze and tried it out, and if you liked it, you, uh, you, you started using it. Uh, there, was no, uh, there was no glaze calculation going on at that point. Making your own glaze was uh, practically unthinkable. When I look at myself, the glaze came as an afterthought. Was it like that for you, or did you make the work and instantly started thinking about color as you was making it? It's interesting. I made the pots for the glaze. It was always like that because uh, the, the Timoku glaze, for instance, required a different thickness on the rim than the Celadon pots. So uh, when I was actually throwing the pot, I was actually thinking of it with the glaze on it. I spent a lot of time designing uh, the, the, the pottery or, or the wear to, for, for the glazes that I was using. It was the way I always, uh, I always did that. I had in my mind, when I was looking at the pot, when I was throwing it, I was looking at it with the glaze on it. Well, I remember in, in school, uh, we would make a bunch of pots, mm -hmm. and then we would, um, we would uh, divide them up and uh, put the glaze, uh, put, Put, put the glazes on then. There was no thought, really, of uh, making, making the pot uh, for the glaze. Mm. But I found that it, was, uh, uh, it improved my chances of, of getting the kind of work that I liked if I, if I actually made the piece with the glaze in mind. And those early days, most of the glazes that was out there were browns and uh, Tomokos and, and, and those kind of colors. It was not the bright colors that we get today. Um, but you also did a little bit of, um, of sculptural work in those early days. Do you still do that? Well, uh, when I was in school, uh, I did every once in a while. I'd get an idea and I would do it in clay. And uh, some of the commissions that I got uh, tended to be sculptural rather than utilitarian. How long did it take for you before you realized that you would like to specialize in glazes? I think that I that I sort of fell into it by accident. I was I'm always the I'm, I'm the kind of person that wants to understand how things are and uh, when I got my first computer I suddenly got very interested in how glazes and clay bodies worked. It was something that, that, that I, really, I really enjoyed getting into. Uh, it, was, it was not easy, it was not, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a uh, mathematician, and uh, it took a lot of hard work. And I can remember uh, starting up with the, uh, the computer program uh, after dinner, and when I, the next time I looked up, like it was 2 o'clock in the morning. But the information was also not readily available. That's right. So how did it come? What, about where, which years, what time in your career would you say it became more available? Because you were also working at Tucker's at one stage. I started in 71 uh, with the clay company. Well, incorporated it in '71, and I sold it in '80, in '81. Uh, and that, that was your own company that you started. Yes, that's right. With a with a with another another guy. 
I was working with uh, stoneware up until that point, and it, in, in 1981, I started working with porcelain. If you ask me why, I, I, can't really, <laughs> I can't really remember. I think that I was just uh, looking for a spark to, uh, to uh, get me more interested in, in learning more. Did you work with stoneware, got into porcelain, and then started fiddling a little bit more? Because I've seen some chinos that you've developed and that you've been working with. That's right. I still do some, some, some porcelain work now and then, but uh, now I'm back with stoneware, and it's a high iron stoneware, so it has a, uh, I'm looking for glazes that have the maximum effect by being over a, a, a high iron clay body. Is there anyone in your family that was at all interested in any kind of creativity when no, you were young? No, no, there was nothing. There wasn't any music in the house. We listened to the radio. There wasn't a television. Uh, but the first time I uh, I touched clay, I realized that I was uh, that I was going to use, be a potter for the rest of my rest of my life. I knew that. You didn't keep the the, the glazing part, which is obviously the part that that distinct you from so many other potters out there in the world. Um, you didn't keep it all for yourself. You started sharing. You, you did not only start sharing your knowledge, you also started helping people to get their glazes corrected. Uh, tell me how that came about. One of the things about sharing and teaching is the amount, uh, the amount that you grow when you, when you do that. Uh, when you share, with other potters, it has a, a deeper meaning than just sharing. When you associate with people who love clay as well, uh, there is something that happens there that is uh, a big plus. I've experienced it all those years that you were involved with clay art. I became involved with clay art, uh, which is basically potters.org, right? Uh, in the in the late 1990s and I remember Ron Roy was just always there if Ron spoke everybody is quiet he spoke the last words and nobody argued with him nobody debated you and you eventually became the doctor of glazes tell me how that happened I think clay art was a phenomenon I mean, it was really something. You could talk to potters all over, all over, mostly North America. But still, the, there, was a, there was so much good information coming all the time and a steady flow. And not only did, did, I, did I feel that I was uh, contributing uh, and earning, uh, the, earning the, uh, the knowledge that was coming, but I was also at that point uh, advertising my skills so that I could uh, make some money from helping other potters uh, solve their technical problems. Being a studio potter who, who doesn't make pots for, for them, who makes pots for himself, is, is not really a viable way to make a, make a living, or it wasn't anyway. So I had to find other ways of doing that, and the clay company was one way. But uh, uh, I got lots of uh, lots of workshops from from that, and uh, well, hundreds of potters that I have helped with their their glazes, and that was always a very good feeling to be able to do that. And then you became the glaze doctor. Did that happen before you got involved with John? Oh yes. Isselberg? Yes, yes, yes. Quite quite well before. You became the glaze doctor and then you and John presented a workshop together at Nsika at one stage. We were at Nsika, we had become friends. We share a common philosophy, John and I. We're very interested in making good, stable, functional glazes. We think that's an important uh, thing. So we became uh, friends on the internet and uh, we finally met at Nsika and uh, we were walking home one day and I said, uh, 
I said, son, I think we should, uh, we should write a book. And uh, he, he said, oh, what do you mean, write a book? I said, well, I think we, we have something to contribute. And uh, so he said, well, let me think about it. And the next day he said, okay. And uh, we got back from Ensika. <laughs> and uh, within, about, uh, within about a month, the first chapter arrived. <laughs> wow. and, and I said, whoa, what's going on here? I haven't started my part yet. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I read it. I made, it, made some changes and sent it back. And, uh, by the, by, and, 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 a, and a few weeks later, the second chapter arrives, right? Well, uh, that's how it was. John wrote the book, except for chapter five. And, uh, and I said to, to we, were, we, were, we were talking about uh, making, a, uh, making a, an agreement partnership agreement, right? And he says, uh, I said, well, he, he, how are we going to share the profits from this, from this book? And he said, well, 50-50. And uh, I said, but John, you've, you've written the whole book. And uh, he says, well, yeah, but you're the pretty face. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, he thought that my reputation would sell books. He was an engineer of some kind. He was a chemical engineer. Uh, what I liked about the book is that you paid a lot of attention in um, talking about possible hazards, um, and specifically hazards that may happen when, when potters apply the glaze and, um, and, and then uh, come out with functional wear. And I've seen it throughout the workshop that we just now recorded for you. It's very close to your heart that people when they want to use the, the functional pieces, uh, that it's a well-fitting glaze and, and that it's a, a safe glaze um, to offer to our um, clients out there. Well, it's, it, the, the, the problem is that there was no information about this. Uh, we had to do our own research. Then I saw Tony Hansen had this program that could calculate glaze. I thought, wow. Now I can do that, and I can see right into the glaze. I can see right into the clay. I can tell, you know, what's going... I have this vision of, of uh, like, the room is, is a glaze, okay? Uh, and I'm inside the glaze, and I'm looking around and say, oh, yeah, that's what's happening here. That's what's going on here, right? Practically invent this, this attitude where uh, you could actually predict uh, whether, you were, whether you had a glaze that was uh, stable and durable. It was really a fascinating ride because we were breaking ground. And there, are, there still are no other books that, the, that, uh, that pay any attention to durability of glazes. And, and I so absolutely agree with you. We were looking at, at some potters online uh, over this past week where they physically show your book and, um, and then they said that it's out of print but you've got some good news about that. That's right, that's right. And you can now buy the book as an iBook and you have been able to do that for, for many years now and you can buy a, uh, a black and white copy. However, uh, there, there's a publishing firm that has uh, our permission to, uh, to produce a color version again. Mastering Cone 6 Glazes is back on the market, guys. Is there anything that you would like to say about the online class specifically? Well, I'd like, I'd like potters to, to understand uh, that this is possible to make uh, durable, safe glazes for their, for their functional work. And it, it's important not only for their own satisfaction, but if you make glazes and sell pots that don't have good glazes on, uh, you run the risk of your customers becoming suspicious and not wanting to buy your pottery anymore. And uh, even worse, uh, they, some may even uh, surmise that all handmade pottery is, uh, is not a good idea to use. And that is a shame for that to happen. I think it's time for us to wrap it up. But you 
had such a beautiful story about the, the plate that I have on my lap here. I would like for you to tell us a story about this. And guys, I want for you to know that I handled several of the most beautiful functional works. And I've handled some of your earlier sculptural work as well uh, this past week. But the story of just a plain plate like this can have so much information in it. Would you please share that with us? The idea for this, the red, brown, and the, and the white, came from a, from a trip uh, where I was down in the, in the Grand Canyon, and it was uh, probably around the Ansika time, so there was still snow. And I saw the snow and the red earth and the patterns, and uh, uh, I came home and I started working on trying to duplicate that look. And these snow plates were, uh, were a result of, uh, of uh, what happened uh, when we were traveling down in Arizona. Uh, I still uh, think that they're some of the best pots that I've ever, ever made. When I, when I make functional wear, I try, try to uh, maximize uh, emptiness by forming things in a way that makes them look empty. Um, if you can achieve this empty look to your wear, people will naturally want to fill it, in other words, use it. Uh, the old story from, from uh, Africa was that uh, if there was two, two potters in, the, in a village, and one potter could solve this problem by making their work uh, illicit use, uh, they would be the potter that survived because people would use their, their work and it would get broken and they would have to come back and buy another one. If there's a philosophy of, uh, of empty space, of inside space. Uh, if, if you're throwing a bottle and uh, when you're finished, if you, if you put your mouth on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the spout and blow into it, you'll see what I mean. That automatically makes it look more attractive. And it's that inside space pushing out is the way to do it. And in that plate, you even succeeded to bring us some stars into your empty space. <laughs> Well, the, the, that, that I thought that, that as you look at the stars at night, you have that feeling of emptiness, that feeling that, 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 uh, that same kind of feeling that I get when I look at a, at a, at a well-thrown pot uh, that has this emptiness that, that's beckoning to be filled. And I thought, well, all right, I'll put a few stars in here and maybe that will accentuate it and uh, you'll have to think for yourself whether it does or not. <laughs> well Ron, I want to thank you for sharing everything with us and guys with that plate I want for you to know that when Ron designed a glaze he's not only thinking about the chemical aspects of it, the physical aspects of it, he's also thinking about the artistic aspects of it. Thank you, Ron. You are an icon. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.